Please note that this session will include a Q&A powered by Slido. To ask a question at any point during the presentation, log on to your Advertising Week app and select Microsoft Stage. Thank you, and please welcome in. The Marketing Society presents Busting Myths with Data. Wonderful. Hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome to our session today. Um, I don't know how many of you in the room know who the Marketing Society is, um, but we're an influential and global network headquartered in London with hubs all around the world from Dubai to India to here in New York. And today marks a very special occasion in that we are one um, in New York as of yesterday where we hosted a party. And I can see lots of people in the audience that joined our party, so it's great to see some familiar faces. Um, everything we do is through our purpose, which is to inspire brave leadership. So we like to tackle taboos, push boundaries, and create comfortable spaces to have uncomfortable conversations, hoping today will be no different. Today is about bringing together brave marketing leaders for an insightful discussion around the myths surrounding data. Marketing for us is the engine, it's the growth for business. What we're going to ask is, have we gone too far with being data-driven? Are we losing the ma magic, the creativity, the gut instincts, or have we found the right balance? And to do that, as we like to do, we've curated an incredible uh, lineup of speakers. Um, so I'd just like to introduce them all to the stage. So first up, we have Suzanne Cole, who is the Executive Vice President of Media for Universal Pictures. If you come and here, lovely. <laughs> <One's there. laughs> um, Manjuri Tamahani, who's the Global Chief Executive of Game Theory. Jason, Jason Shabib, who is the Vice President of Consumer Planning, Diageo, and importantly, a board member here in New York for the Society. And and sorry, I was just going to see my list, sorry. And last but no means least, uh, Christy Argelin, who is the Senior Vice President, Media and Guest Engagement for Target. Welcome, all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, and there will be time to ask questions, and we'll do that through the app. But obviously, if people want to put their hand up, we will try and do that if we've got enough time. Um, but I'm going to start with... Um, each of you are in very different industries and face completely different challenges. So really keen to get a bit of a journey about your organisation on how you've managed to um, help it be more data and insight led. Um, so I'm going to start with you, Suzanne. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> in the movie business, there's obviously a lot riding on that launch moment. And each and every movie is different, making your job, I'm sure, quite challenging. And obviously, we've, we've had a call before, so I think that's, that's true. Um, so how does data play into your decision-making process? Um, I want to start by like two seconds on why, um, what the challenges actually are, because um, most folks probably don't know. Uh, we have what we call a snowflake problem. So all of our movies are dramatically different, just like snowflakes, and they're also perishable. So if you think of um, the movies, say, that we've had in the marketplace this past week, we had Night School with Kevin Hart, we had um, uh, First Man with Ryan Gosling, and we have Halloween with Jamie Lee Curtis. If you've seen any of the advertising, you would probably be hard pressed to find out how they're similar. Um, we opened Night School this past weekend, and Night School is now, as far as I'm concerned, it is done. We had a very narrow window to either succeed or fail, or as they say, it was either a party or a face plant. Um, <laughs> and thankfully, it was a party in this case. Uh, but the challenges for us around information and data, and for me, I kind of use them a bit interchangeably, mm. um, is that we have a hard time figuring out what is applicable across all our different titles and what is um, essentially predictive of an outcome because of how different everything is. So um, in the early days, we had a lot of um, research coming in. It was you know, somewhat traditional research, but it was you know, broad. It was also quite predictive and reliable. Now what we have is a tremendous amount of information that is um, like oceans of data coming into us. Um, and it is challenging to figure out what is predictive and what is reliable. Basically, what is it telling us about the audience's intent? And 
We have um, sort of garnered a team, you know, pretty much everyone has to be an expert in this area in our marketing department now, but we've garnered <laughs> a team together that does a lot of top of funnel work, a lot of work with modeling, and as, as well as a lot of individual, you know, looking at um, targeted advertising and how we get to what it means and trying to figure out which pieces matter and which pieces don't as we're trying to persuade you all to go to our movies. And how do you bring people along the journey in, in that journey of, of data and insight? Um, it is, uh, I would say, start with a safe room. And I know that's not what people in a data conversation want to talk about. You know, we want to talk about all the tools we have and everything. And they're all there and they continue to evolve. I think for us, if you are in marketing right now, you have to figure out how to understand the application of data. And so what we started was um, a group of folks who could ask dumb questions, who didn't all have the same skill sets, and we kind of allowed everyone to learn the, to get to a sort of basic level, and then grew everyone from there. And we had a lot of really good ideas about how to approach the information we're getting back from people who are not data scientists. You know, they're creatives. They're, you know, in some cases, they're, tr you know, traditional media folk who say, well, what about this question and how do we do that? So it's more, it's at the end of the day, creating a really safe environment to look dumb, like, you know, which is not that. exactly technical. But. I love that, to get uncomfortable. And diversity of thought there sounds like, like hugely plays in. Thank you. So Manju, I'm going to move to you. What do you think are the biggest challenges faced by CMOs today around data and insight? So we've done quite a bit of research mm. over the last five years looking at some of the challenges and pain points of CMOs, primarily to really influence and inform our solutions. So Game Theory is a global marketing foresight consultancy, and we help marketing professionals such as Suzanne, Jason and Christy to make faster, smarter business decisions using data technology, advanced analytics. And you know, if we go back to the research originally, going back about four or five years ago, there were four very clear pain points that came through at that time. The first was around being swamped by data. Mm -hmm. So wanting to be a more data-driven organization, but not really knowing where to start that journey. The second was very much around confusion about the amount of jargon and terminology in the industry. And, really and there's not, a lot in our industry, right? Uh, and, and just not knowing <laughs> what half of it actually meant with all the various acronyms. Yeah, yeah. So that was a real challenge. Um, the third was the inconsistency. So a CMO would ask a question, they'd get two different answers. How do I make a decision mm. if it's not consistent? And then for CMOs, even if they had the data, even if they understood the jargon and terminology, even if they believed the insight, often it was just too slow. You know, they had to make a decision well in advance of mm. actually receiving those insights. You know, when we move now to today, those, um, those challenges have evolved quite considerably. And I would say that most organizations now have access to really good quality data. But it's unlocking the value within that data. And they don't always have the skills internally to, um, to get to those insights. So CMOs are telling us that they're data rich, but insights poor, particularly insights that they can apply mm. to the business. Also, they're saying that it's hard to really get a sense of what are the metrics that really matter within their organization. Mm. So creating a marketing strategy, if you don't know what the business objectives are, that's, that's a challenge. And also silos, departments with information that they're just not sharing. Mm -hmm. So challenges around organizational structure. Um, so people process all of that. Um, but ultimately, the biggest thing that we're hearing from CMOs is that you know, they really just want to be able to make marketing relevant and drive their business forward. And the biggest challenge they face is just the pace of change. And, just the variety of, of communication touch points for, for consumers today. Yeah, <laughs> couldn't, couldn't agree more. So I'm going to come to, 
to you now, Christy, and then we'll come to Jason afterwards. Oh, I am, might have noticed I'll take a man of the I am panel. Great <laughs> <laughs> right in the middle. Right. But a great, right. a great, right. a great right. token man to have. Um, so, so Christy, obviously Target is a hugely respected brand that many marketers look up to. So what's been your experience when it comes to merging uh, maths and magic? Yeah, so uh, math and magic is actually a um, term that we coined probably about a year and a half mm. ago. Uh, and um, it came in, this, in the spirit of needing to find the balance between uh, the gut that we had in terms of being a really, um, I guess, emotional uh, marketing organization. So we understood the power of the brand. There was a lot of great marketing instinct that went into building that brand over the years. But at the same time, we had so much more um, data and ability to measure that it was on us to take responsibility for uh, a rather large marketing investment that we make as a company. Mm -hmm. And so um, we started to really strike this interesting balance between all of the creativity that built this great brand with all of the measurement that we could now do. Uh, we no longer had it siloed just with our digital channels. Um, and we no longer only had a marketing mix modeling tool that we could use. And we just um, really put in a lot of work and effort um, with our partners at Gain Theory and Essence to just unlock the capability that we had um, access to because we are a company that works with first party data that has mm -hmm. a lot of um, tools at our disposal. Um, and so now we're uh, I you know, work closely with our executive creative director. We are doing things like optimizing television. Uh, last holiday season, we were sitting at a table looking at the performance of our um, campaign for the holidays. And we were discovering that there was one video asset that was actually performing better than another. And so within just a couple of days, we had a new uh, TV spot to get into rotation and we saw the performance of that line item in our campaign actually start to improve. So you can kind of see where the balance of an organization that does consider the brand an asset, mm -hmm. not a cost center. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, nice. <laughs> that's a big step. Um, and the company has always believed that. But now we're um, completely signed up as a marketing organization to take the responsibility for the enormous investment that we, we um, put into the brand to prove that it's actually working. And some of the things that we've cracked recently that's been really exciting is that every month we're looking at advertising influence sales. And so we are um, to the point now where we can really show how uh, marketing is driving sales for the company. Um, and we're also separately but working on figuring out how to get longer term brand health metrics built into that at the same time so that we can make sure that we're not making short term sales decisions um, at the sacrifice of the long term brand health. Um, so we're, you know, we're, it's just super exciting with the different things that we're cracking now through the work we're doing. I think there's a lot of people in this audience that want to pick your brains a bit further on all of that. It sounds, <laughs> sounds brilliant. So, Jason. Not just in the audience. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, Jason, uh, Diageo obviously has a multiple of brands within its portfolio, but an incredibly sophisticated set um, in set up in the data and insights area. How have you been able to break down silos in the organisation to get people synced up on the goals? Um, <clears throat> well, before I answer the question, I think if my CMO ever said to me that he was rich on data and poor on insight, I'd take myself out and shoot myself first thing next morning because I would be <laughs> such a bad indictment. Um, I, actually have, I actually have quite a severe case of imposter syndrome sitting up here because we are so much earlier as Diageo in our, in our journey of of in our journey with data and using data. I mean, I'm, I'm having this recurring fancy about kidnapping these three people, <laughs> <laughs> putting, them, putting, them in a, putting them in a cupboard. Uh, in, 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 a large five, cupboard? Five, or? Five, I'm, I don't care. At, five, at, at 535th Avenue and, and opening it every day and saying, how do I do this? Just tell me how to do this next thing. And because he has there's some great an, drinks to uh, <laughs> well, share in the and, cupboard. And, and actually, I think, I think that's been part of the problem, actually, because, not problem, it's been part of the journey why we're here, the journey that's led us here, which is that good liquor has this annoying habit of kind of more or less selling itself, or used to have a, the annoying habit of more or less selling itself. So 
we are not actually as sophisticated marketers as sometimes we like to think, or as sometimes we look to the outside world. Um, we are still quite early in our journey. Um, we are finding out how to really use data effectively. Uh, look, I, I would I would actually rather be here than than you know be an old hand at it or an old lag at it because actually it's fantastic fun um, learning how to do data when not you haven't got hundred people around you going no don't do it like that you do it like this. You know? <laughs> I love the fact that I can kind of run how we we manage data and present data. The silos thing is a real issue, mm -hmm. and I think there are two things the two key things actually that, that you need to do if you want to break down the exclusivity of data and the, the ability of data to divide people into those who are comfortable using it and those who aren't or those who use it in one way and those who use it in another. And Suzanne already mentioned one of the first ones which is actually to try and take fear out of the equation. So actually to, to, you've got to do everything you can to, to make people less afraid of data and less afraid of handling it. And the second thing is something that goes hand in hand with that, I think, and, and something where we are, we are just starting to learn more about how to, to, to do this well, and that's data visualization. Because what it's hard for data people to sometimes realize that the other people that are using the data are kind of human beings and not looking at data all the time. And you need to make it really quick and instinctive for them to understand what is the story that data is telling. Because data isn't about data, data is about the stories that data tells. So the visualization of data, I think, is the next big thing, certainly, certainly for us, and I would say more broadly than that as well. So really getting amazingly good. If you go to universities and if you go to the real outposts of data management and visualization, people are doing some incredible things. Mm. If you look on YouTube at some of the kind of population population graphs of the world, and, and, and you can find a, you can find a number of them where people have visualized data in the most visceral, most instinctive, most fantastic ways. And I I geek out on that stuff all the time, and I'm <laughs> trying every day to bring it into our business. So um, I would act, if anybody is great at data visualization and wants to email me. Jason wow. Shabib at theadjo.com. <laughs> that, that those, those will be the ones that won't go straight into the bin. Well, brilliant. Well, there's, there's an invitation, my goodness. Okay, so since this is about um, busting myths, I'm going to ask you all um, to tell us about a myth you have busted with data and insights. Um, I'm going to be quite punchy on this answer, possible, because we've got a lot more questions and want to involve the audience as well. So I'm going to start with, with you first. So what's, what's the myth for you? Yeah, I think one of the biggest ones is that the big expensive brand moments that we do, um, think of the Grammys and how we usually show up for those, they actually drive sales. They're not just a big brand moment, but they actually drive sales for the company as well. What's key is using your measurement tools to understand which pieces of the program that we put out there are actually driving the sales so you know what to dial up and what to dial down. Nice, nice. Jason. Um, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of um, be, be a bit self-referential here. Um, and, and I'll be open about this because there's a whole bunch of people here, no doubt, who've worked with Diageo in the past and will be familiar with the thing I'm about to tell you about. So Diageo used to have this tool called the four A's, and it was like a ladder. And uh, I, I try and get this right. The, the, the ladder, you were either available, an acceptor, an adopter, or an adorer. So um, those were the four A's. And the whole idea was to move people up the ladder from less committed to your brand to more committed to your brand. And I used to judge the global, I used to be part of the panel that judged the global marketing plans that were submitted from all the countries. And every single one of them had the forays in it and every single one of them articulated their goals as how do we move people up the ladder. Fast forward a few years and in a post Ehrenberg, post Byron Sharp world, nobody, well, and I hope this is not too uncomfortable for any of you out there, nobody should be thinking that that holds any water anymore because it's nonsense, right? The idea that you are trying to turn everybody into a committed advocate for your brand, especially in a category like ours, which doesn't even make sense when you take a step back and think about it. And it was only through the advent of not just data, but but big data and big analytics that Ehrenberg and other people made it possible for us to come along and go, 
it isn't actually about creating heavy buyers, creating a few heavy buyers, because it's always a pyramid, right? And you're driving people up the pyramid, but the top few are people at the top. It's actually about coming back down and accepting that everybody's likely to remain and be, over the long term, a light buyer of your brand and of your category, and therefore to deal with them accordingly. And that's how you build, that's how you build a brand franchise. And, and we, it was one of the biggest myths in our company, and data came along and just killed it at one stroke. Brilliant. Manjari. So, okay, Gemma, I know you love sort of brave, <laughs> bold leadership in marketing, um, but I sometimes think Indeed. we learn the best lessons from the mistakes that we make. Oh, mm -hmm. completely. And so I'm going to give you an example of a, um, a myth that wasn't busted as a result of having the insight, so despite having the insight. Nice. So this is a, a global financial services organisation, and they were spending a huge amount of money on brand activity, um, trying to acquire new customers, but also a lot of call to action, direct response type activity. The board of this organization decided, no, we need to go down a much more targeted route. We need to become much more digitally focused, and that should be the direction we go in. We've got a lot of first party data. We can talk directly to our consumers, and that's what we should do. Let's divert the money away from brand building activity into call to action. And um, this was very much endorsed by the board, by the CMO. They called us in to say, well, can you tell us how much of a benefit this is going to have for our organization? So we went in, and it was like, oh, actually, you're going to have a detrimental impact on your business. This is actually a bad decision to make because you've no longer got the ability to bring in new customers and talk about the brand and build that emotional mm -hmm. connection. The CMO, because it was endorsed by the board, decided, well, I'm going to ignore the insight. I'm going to go ahead and support the strategy anyway. Um, and in fact, even went against the experience of his own team and the advice of his own team, as well as the insight. So lo and behold, four months later, um, sales pretty much dropped off in line with the projections. So, you know, for me, being brave as a marketing leader is being open, sort of listening to the insight, but also listening to the advice and the experience of the people around you. And sometimes being brave enough to maybe admit when you're I mean, you might be wrong. And what's he doing now? <laughs> what's he doing? And are you brave enough to admit the brand we're talking about? No. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's after in the drinks. It's just you would kill her. <laughs> Brilliant. I, no, I think it's so important to, to look from a, uh, you know, looking at failure because there's so much we can learn from that. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Um, again, super briefly, just a little chunk of a story, which is um, the belief for, I'm not even going to say years, for decades in the movie business was that you couldn't change what we were doing and test it because you don't test things on live patients, you have, there's too much risk, um, <laughs> that you can't quantify uh, the, the intrinsic factors that aren't traditional data, the things like how, you know, how, um, I don't want to insult creatives, but how good the creative is year, you know, over time. Um, you can't quantify uh, people's, um, how well the film's going to review. You can't quantify even if the film is going to be good or what people's perceptions of it, of it being good are. And um, therefore, the idea of doing advanced analytics and modeling work was never going to take hold. And we tried at a fairly modest cost to figure out um, how to apply essentially math, how to, how to create number representations of things that typically aren't represented with numbers, and then tested to see which things mattered and which things didn't. And um, the optimal part of this, though, is the fact that it was done in a way that minimized the risk. Because as long as you are in a world where if you fail on an opening weekend, you've just, it's possible you've literally flushed $80 million of the company's mm -hmm. money. Um, you have to figure out how to do this in a way that is um, lower risk, or as I always, I, I, I like to say, it's not about the upside, it's about how do you break even? And then in the, if you get upside, awesome. Nice, very nice. We've got a question from the audience. Are you happy, mm. happy to take it? So just for, for everyone, <laughs> can you, can, is, it up, is it up somewhere? It's there. I, I don't know if it was, I didn't know if it was <laughs> up there and you guys could no. see it or if I just read it out, <laughs> technology and, and yeah. me. Um, yeah, interesting. So, Christy, um, how can one measure advertising influence sales and how to include <laughs> brand health me metrics as sure. well? Sure. So I'll take the last 
part of that first, yep, um, because that actually is an open question mm. in the industry. So we absolutely we have brand health metrics, um, but they are separate from the marketing mix modeling work that we do. Um, and so what we're trying to figure out right now is how do we bring the two of them together so mm. that we can understand how the levers of each mm. impact both short-term and long-term sales. Um, it, I am uh, on a separate um, organization board that uh, is actually taking that on as a topic to try to wrestle to the ground because we're all struggling with that. Mm. Um, because I think we've all seen the impact of what happens when you are only focusing on the models which are so great at short-term sales. Mm. Um, you can short-term sales yourself right into a dead brand. Um, <laughs> and so we just want to make sure that we are bringing those things together so that we've got the same people who are doing the work mm. thinking about long-term and short-term decisions that they're making. Um, in terms of measuring advertising, influence sales you know we're um, probably like Suzanne we're in this lovely place where we have so much inform so much data that comes to us and we both have companies that invest greatly in data scientists and technology um, so engineers so that we can actually do as much modeling as we need to do and so we've got all of the key factors that influence our business um, similar to what you have too mm -hmm. including uh, weather, geography, categories. Um, so it's e easier for us to be able to um, to uh, to ring fence mm. advertising impact on our sales. Um, and we have about 1,600 data engineers in our company who are really focused on understanding how to build what I would call an enterprise scorecard that allows us to look at the five or six big levers that really uh, drive the health of our business and including things like store operations. So if you have really low NPS scores for some reason based on a store experience, we see that that has a direct impact on our sales, similar to when we look at the marketing activities that we're doing. Um, are those marketing activities actually showing a lift in sales or not? Okay, lovely. I'm can not going to ask that ask next question. Can I ask a little build on that question? Yeah. And by the way, whoever posted that question, Thanks for, thanks for making the other three of us feel, feel unwanted. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, I'm not asking as well because right there's in. too many acronyms. No wonder you went anonymous there. for it. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I, just, I, just, I just want to put, I just want to put a view out in the room, and, and to my colleagues as well, actually. I think brand health metrics may be overrated as, as a pursuit. I think for a number of reasons. First of all, they lag, usually lag massively. Secondly, they fluctuate all over the place. And thirdly, if I worked in a business like yours, I would look at the behavior of people every day of the week long before I looked at brand health metrics. Absolutely. Because what you're, look, what you're looking for from people loving a brand like yours is to go and, go and shop there. So I'm not, I, I, I have this kind of hunch, which I'm not going to explore in detail, but I think I'm just putting it out there. Oh, I think, I'm going to report back I, next I, I year think, on what yeah, we find. I just, I just think, brand, I think we spend, we, I just think brand health metrics are an overrated thing. Well, you know, one of the, so there are a couple of aspects to that that we're, that we're asking ourselves, which is, are the brand health metrics that have come here to fore still relevant today when you consider all of the things that actually influence whether or not your brand is healthy? Yeah. And we are well aware that the experience that you have in our store probably influences how you feel about our brand um, more or just as much as all of the marketing that we put out into yeah. the world. Agreed. And so that's an important piece. Um, the other piece to that too though is that we especially are looking at brand health metrics to make sure that we're actually evolving the way that we're doing marketing so that we're staying relevant today uh. um, because what it took to have a healthy brand before used to be you know giant TV spots right have <laughs> big production waving wheat fields um you know and that's just that's not what it takes anymore so it's our scorecard in terms of are we putting the right kind of marketing programs out into the world and are we starting to see things like relevance um, continue to hold or grow because we're actually marketing in a different way oh, good nice thank you now i'm going to move the subject um this one on a little bit and, and talk from a different angle and this question's for you uh Manjuri. um do you think data and insights can go too far what about the magic what about the gut instinct oh i definitely um feel as though it's the combination of the logic that you get from the insight mm. but the magic of the creativity and, and the marketing and so much of that is down to the experience and and the kind of the gut instinct um there was a client who said to me recently and i really like this that a hundred percent of our decisions must include data 
but our decisions will not be 100% data driven. So it's about having the balance of, of the two. And I was reading recently that um, scientists have actually found that there's a second brain yeah. in our gut. In your gut. Yeah. It's like a 10 million neurons that are sat there. And that's the equivalent to the size of a the brain of an adult cat. Wow. So, I mean, like, that's just phenomenal that's that we've thing. got this second brain that sat here. That explains so, so much. <laughs> So when we think about, you know, data, data driven, it's, it's more about being data informed and, yeah. you know, taking the, the insights that you have, but also um, taking into your experience and your gut instinct, all of that, you know, it might not be quite so brainless after all. You know, we're really big on that, too, and we're so careful to make sure that we don't lose the balance between the two. Um, and you do find when you put these great tools in people's hands, they will want to use them as a shield on some days. Yeah. Uh -huh. And you have to be really careful that they don't do that because there's all those years of experience that come from being marketers that also needs to be at the table at the same time you're being informed by the data. It's like you said, create a safe space where mm -hmm. people can really take part. Well, and we, we have a lot of conversations around the data is telling us X. And, you know, that may or may not be true. But when we are, we sort of say, okay, if it's telling us this, what's the theory of why it might be telling us this? If you can come up with a, a human reason why that is happening, it's a lot easier to believe that what it's telling you is, again, predictive and reliable as opposed to just you know, noise. Yeah. So how did you overcome the initial skepticism around bringing more science and rigor to the magic of movie marketing? <laughs> well, I want to start by saying it was not clearly just me. There is a, a team of people who were very um, engaged across the disciplines mm. with the idea of there's all of this happening out in the world with the digital information that we're getting and with what's happening with, and, you know, with, with TV and the, the, a lot of the information we were already seeing um, coming back through our more traditional research. Um, we have to find ways as an industry to do what we're doing for, to be honest, a, a lower marketing investment. Like that's a challenge. And I don't think that makes us any different than virtually every company out there, mm. you know, margins get squeezed even if you have a lot of money. Mm. So it's that, you know, I think folks were really interested in figuring out that puzzle. And I think we also had a collaborative culture because we can't, movies are not launched alone. You know, the, at the end of the day, the publicity and the marketing messaging and the media and the, all the digital marketing, all of those things actually do need to be sort of one ecosystem. So we were already kind of there on that part. It was just mm -hmm. understanding what the level of risk we were willing to take and, and to create a journey that got us to a place that we thought would build our business. Nice, thank you. Jason, how does data and insight play alongside creativity in, in Diageo? So I think, I think the, the world splits into two types of marketers. Those who think data is a kind of annoying thing that's getting in the way of them exercising their judgment, which is always brilliant. And those who are quite happy to learn from data. And I feel like the relationship between data and creativity is, is a constant dialogue. It's a bit like what you know from data and what you feel about creativity are constantly passing the ball to each other. Mm. Oh, that's how it should work. And if you stop doing that, I think that's when you, you start to suffer um, because you start to ignore one side of it. So anybody who's been through a process of um, developing strategy, developing consumer-facing work, in executing and implementing consumer-facing work knows that you are alternately checking in with your strategy side or using your strategy side to generate the next step, which might then be a creative step, which is a different kind of thing, but then you'll come back and check that in a kind of data-driven way, and then you'll go out and be creative again when you make it, and then you go out and be creative when you plan the media, but then you check whether it's giving you the reach you want. So if you actually think about the whole process, it's a constant to and fro between the, the, side, of, of the side of our business and our business personas that is measurable with data and accessible and the side which is of necessity 
unmeasurable because it takes, goes into the creative realm where people are doing things they've never done before. And, and the whole point about creativity, no matter how limited the creative scope is, is you're trying to do something that's never been done before. Hence, mm -hmm. create if, right? So it's that that's tension that we kind of we need to get comfortable with, we need to nurture, we need to facilitate, and that's how it should work. Nice. It doesn't always, but that's how it should work. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I'd like to dig a bit deeper, but I'm very aware of time. Um, so what I wanted to do is, is finish with all of you um, in the style of a tweet. Jason, <laughs> punchy, pithy. <laughs> <laughs> what is your final piece of advice to our audience today around using data and insights to lead change, create business growth, and importantly, be braver marketing leaders? So who wants to go first? Can I, can I come to you? Sure, Jesse? I'll go first yeah. um, because I'm going to steal mine from our executive creative director. Huh. My team loves this one. Um, he says that if you cannot prove it, you, or if you can't measure it, you can't prove it. And if you can't prove it, you can't improve it. Huh. Love that. I bet that's out there on, on tweets right now. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, Todd Waterbury. Brilliant. Todd Brilliant. Waterbury. Um, Jason. <laughs> I think it it starts with mindset. So it actually has nothing to do with data. It has everything to do, your question has everything to do with leadership. If you want, if anybody here, if, if, if any of us wants to be leaders, that's where we have to start, with the desire to lead. After that, everything else, data and creativity, is in support of that. So use it to the best of your ability, but never forget that what you're doing should be leading your business to growth. It's about leadership. And any tips on how to be a great leader? That's a whole other. <laughs> I, I am, Next when they email you. I'm available for yeah. weddings and bar mitzvahs <laughs> to talk about that. I, I, could do, I, could do two in, I could do two days on that. If anyone's going to TMRE in Scottsdale, Arizona, I will be doing exactly that talk there. And you can come and hear me. Brilliant. So it's a huge, that's a huge question. Brilliant. I hope for your talk for our leadership course as well um, later on in the year, maybe. Do we have one? We, we do, we do. So, um, of course I will. Yeah, yeah. Slight plug there. Didn't mean to do that. <laughs> right, uh, Manjuri. <laughs> um, so, in the start of the tweet, so um, <clears throat> beware of chasing the shiny new pennies all the time and ask yourself the question, why? And so what I mean by that is with all of the opportunities that currently exist within uh, the marketing industry right now, what is it going to actually mean for your organisation? What's it going to mean for your brand? And ultimately, what's it going to mean for your consumers? You know, we really try to help our, um, our clients to, to question the why and to put it into context. So absolutely evaluate it, have a look at the, the relevance, but then put it into context of what it's actually going to do in terms of driving growth for your business. Very nice. And last, but no means. Least. I'm going to go back to a theme I said earlier, which is um, ask the stupid question. It probably isn't stupid. And um, I am rarely the first person to talk in a, in a big meeting. In analytics meetings, a number of people in this room have heard me ask the following question. I hear what you said. Could you speak it in English now, please? Because I <laughs> generally am like, I need you to tell me why, like, what this means. I hear the numbers, but tell me what it means. And then later, often my team will be like, yeah, I had no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> we, do that, we do that with acronyms. Yeah. Yes. What, Stop what the that? meeting and go, like, use your words. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. That, that is so true. And our industry is uh, big culprits of that. I mean, how many of us have sat in a room and thought, I have no idea. That wasn't actually English sometimes. I'm yeah. certain of it. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, we've actually still got a little bit of time, which is very, very um, rare. So I want to ask you a question I didn't get to ask you um, okay. earlier, um, but we've only got about uh, a minute to, to do it. But what, what, what are you working on today that, that excites you the most? Um, for 2019, it's cracking television. And we are in this place now with the work that we're doing around um, buying television programmatically, mm. applying our first party data to it um, so that we're using a different measurement. Um, so the, the metric by which we're um, rating it, uh, and then this idea of being able to optimize it in near real time. Excellent. Jason? I, I have now forgotten what I'm doing because that is so exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so seriously Come hang out with me. He, well, you're going into his cupboard. <laughs> 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 Make sure I get home tonight. <laughs> yeah, it's only a matter of time. Um, 
What about, and now I'm genuinely, and now I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely. So, okay. Um, so we, we t in, in, a, in, in one second, we are very, uh, we've, we've ditched all our consumer segmentations and we have an occasions-based segmentation. Wow. So we are only asking ourselves what occasion are consumers buying spirits in or for and that is our big that is our big thing right now is an occasions based segmentation which totally changes so many things about the way we do business and is actually incredibly exciting also excellent mm -hmm. and if you email him i'm sure you can find out more yeah. about that <laughs> <laughs> Not a or would that be the ones that go in the bin <laughs> 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 right, we have um, nearly, nearly uh, run out of time. So all that's left for me to do is say thank you so much. That was such an insightful conversation. I hope you all found, found it as interesting and inspiring as, as I did. I think there's lots of learning um, that we can all take back to our organisations. Um, I'm looking forward to the pictures of you guys in the cupboard together. <laughs> that, that'll be interesting. Um, <laughs> but I really want to say a huge thank you to our speakers, Christy, Jason, Mundry and Suzanne. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.